everyone. Uh, welcome to Special Food Choices Talk Show Podcast Series. Uh, this is Kanika Nandurikar. I'm founder of Nikan Superfoods. Uh, we have today uh, Ms. Ishi Kosla. Uh, she's the founder of the Salix Society of India. She's a practicing clinical nutritionist, a researcher, an author, a columnist, and a welfare worker too. As a uh, year 2023 has been uh, declared as an international year of millets. We'll be talking with Ms. Ishi on the benefits of using millets in the daily life. Uh, but before that, uh, we would like to congratulate her on her new book. Uh, the name is The 4G Code to the Good Health. Welcome to the show, Ishi. Thank you. Thank you, Kanika, for having me. And thank you for introducing the book. I'm excited about the new book and uh, yeah, happy to take this forward with you. Sure. Uh, so Ishi, uh, what are the four Gs uh, which you are referring to in your book and how they are important to understand your own body science? Yeah, so uh, the book, when I thought about, you know, the compulsion to write about something which was getting completely ignored by uh, our, you know, the current health uh, conversations and uh, nutritional uh, packages, the diet um, philosophies. We were all talking about calories and nutrients and the usual, uh, you know, cutting one nutrient uh, or the other. Sometimes we were cutting calories, sometimes we were cutting fat, sometimes we were increasing proteins or fats and you know fasting all those things have been um, you know mainstream but uh, as a practitioner I realized that there was much more to uh, you know food than just nutrients and that what that food was doing uh, in our in our bellies in our gut was the critical uh, game changer so certain foods were helping us uh, achieve our uh, targets whether it was weight or whether it was uh, disease management and uh, certain foods which were disturbing the gut uh, you know kept us away from uh, achieving those targets and uh, it was becoming very clear that uh, literally when a patient walked into uh, the clinic he you know he had multiple problems and uh, if we changed the grain itself we were able to solve not only his weight problem, but the multiple problems like, say, mental health issues, anxiety, diabetes, joint pains, mood, sleep. So many, okay. you know, they, they come with the baggage. So even reproductive problems, even uh, breathing problems and uh, neurological problems, they all got sorted in a very short span of time. And that's when we uh, used to suspect the, you know, the role of wheat and uh, gluten in wheat. And um, way back, about, I would say, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we had tests. We had started, uh, you know, we were, uh, the lab work was very accurate. The tests, which were almost like 99% accurate, had been um, become available to us to, uh, to screen for celiac disease. But, um, you know, when we did the celiac test on these patients who were improving on wheat-free diets, the celiac tests were negative. But yet we knew that the problem is, is there and, you know, the, there is something that is making them change even though they don't have celiac disease. And uh, so about, I would say, uh, 10, 15, 12 years ago, a little longer, we discovered and then I researched and I found that there was a whole entity called non-celiac wheat sensitivity, right. which was also relatively new in the research world. It was just emerging and I said, hey, this is what my patients are suffering from. They don't have celiac, but they're reacting to wheat as much as badly as uh, a celiac would. And uh, then by, you know, process of research and uh, education and self-learning, we figured that uh, this was really the game changer for most people who were struggling with weight, who were struggling with high cholesterol, with high blood pressure, with uh, reproductive issues, infertility, miscarriages, uh, mood issues, and uh, so on and so forth. So uh, that is then I when I said that, you know, if this is it, then this has to go down in my next book. Okay. And uh, because this was helping me join all the dots. Literally, when, you know, patients came, we could tell that their gut has got affected 
And that's how, uh, you know, whether it's got affected primarily because of wheat or because of something else and they have become sensitive to wheat. That's a chicken okay. and egg situation. Yeah. But we knew that, you know, particularly post-pregnancy when the gut undergoes changes or post-illness, say or po post a surgery when you're taking a lot of medication, like we have long COVID, long okay. medication, that's when the gut is undergoing changes. Um, and we uh, see this development of food sensitivities. In fact, uh, even in women, PCOD became a huge problem. Uh, suddenly, you know, the last 12, 15 years, we never heard of it earlier in as much uh, as, uh, they, as we see it today. And uh, they were not even obese. Some of the girls were very, very lean and thin. And uh, they were given hormones and they were given a whole lot of things to eat because uh, that's what the mainstream gynecological treatment is. And they mm. would then come up with anxiety and bloating and all that. And I said, no, you you know, you started reacting to wheat because your gut is getting affected with these things. Mm. So yes. when whatever it is, it just helped us join the dots in people's lives and come to the real, you know, the crux of the problem or literally hitting the nail on the head. And we... Um, Therefore, it was all about the gut and uh, we healed the gut, we removed the, the, the grains which were bothering the gut. And uh, also, uh, you know, all of this is about creating inflammation in the body. Okay, so yeah, that's um, what you have talked about more. Yeah. Yes, book, that's also. what we talked about in the book, because that is really uh, where the, all diseases in our body really start inflammation whether it's heart disease, it doesn't happen overnight. It's low-grade inflammation, yeah. which takes a toll. And um, so whether it's cancer, whether it's thyroid problems, whatever we're dealing with, it all starts with inflammation. So all diseases really uh, start there. And this is what happens with um, gluten and when the gut gets, uh, you know, disturbed. And um, so then, you know, we also realize that large bellies, that is a girth, abdominal fat, is also highly inflammatory. You know, there's a lot of people who uh, are very thin and normal BMIs, and like I told you, these little girls who are very mm -hmm. thin, uh, but they have belly fat. So we, I decided to put that down also. You know, the gut okay. girth connection as a, you know a con contributor to inflammation had to be put there. So we wrote gut and girth and, and uh, gluten being the biggest trigger for inflammation uh, for most people today. Um, it may not be the only one, but it is one of the key contributors. And uh, sugars also seem to be uh, aggravating the problem. And sugars could be hiding in form of sweets and bakery products, all the mitais and sugary drinks or in the form of grains and, you know, uh, typically breads and the uh, extra carbs that the chapatis and the, yeah, the products that we may really make out of staples are also really one step away from sugar. So in the body, you know, it takes a few minutes only for that grain yeah. to become sugar. So we, I thought we should uh, have undivided attention on this as well. Okay. So you may be having, um, you know, everything right, but maybe just having too much of sugar itself or in the form of grains and carbs. So all of these were the key areas I thought would, which needed to be addressed. Um, and that's how the book came about. And um, I, I was very tempted to add the 5G because this was when there was 4G and that is how long ago the book was in my head. But finally okay. happened when 5Gs have come. And uh, the fifth G was actually the genes, you know, the genetic oh. makeup which yes. controls uh, everything. So, and, so that um, so we can that... expect another series of uh, your next book, <laughs> <laughs> maybe another topic to talk about. Yes, I think now it's better to talk on the digital platform and social media. Not too many people are, have, you know, have the attention span to read. Right, right. No, so uh, absolutely, um, yes. right. So 4G is basically, uh, so gut, gluten, uh, glucose and girth, right? That's what yes. uh, it's been so represented what, well, well mannered. In I the say book. gut, girth, gluten, and glucose. So the oh, parts okay. of the body That's which are important below the waist and above the hips, if inside out is outside is a girth and inside is a gut. Right. Right. And uh, the two key components today which need to be looked at. Okay. are Gluten and glucose, and maybe gluten. Um, there was 
uh, slash here, I thought I could do grains instead of gluten because there, is, there are other grains which also mm. uh, trigger inflammation because you are wheat sensitive. They are not directly gluten containing grains. But, uh, but anyway, I said, let's hit the bullseye and say what has to be said. Right, right, right. So, uh, so Ishi, what are the initial signs of gluten intolerance or the symptoms basically which people uh, may not notice or ignore because of their uh, indulgent food habits or basically wrong uh, food choices? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Kanika. Because uh, very often we see problems with people who do not have gut symptoms right. or gut-related issues. So in an audience... Maybe maybe thirty percent people say they have gut symptoms, and seventy percent mm. say we don't have gut symptoms. So is that not Absolutely. relevant to us? That means, um, you know, are are we don't have a gut issue? No, that's absolutely untrue because um, almost there are statistics and data here, but um, mostly patients who um, uh, it's very actually compelling to hear that that out of uh, one person who has gut-related symptoms, there are eight who do not have gut-related symptoms and okay. have uh, problems with wheat. So okay. uh, it's that skewed. And uh, so uh, gut-related symptoms may be nil, but you may be suffering from gut-related issues. It could be an immune system. It could be just, you know, you're falling ill very... Uh, I'm talking of immune system because of the COVID-19 uh, really pandemic. Right. It became uh, so. Yeah. Where, where does immunity start? It starts in the gut because most your a seventy two third uh, or seventy percent of the immune system sits in the gut. So uh, you know you have to begin there, and you may not have any gut related issues, but that's what you have to address. And um, you, uh, I, I will tell you how that happens. But um, so uh, you can have symptoms right from you know just having. Fatigue, that's what I see the most among okay. youngsters also. Low energy, uh, you may have insomnia, you may have body pains, joint pains, muscle pains. You can have uh, just, um, you know, PCOS. You may have uh, acne, skin problems like alopecia, psoriasis, eczema. So they could be outward symptoms. They could be uh, just things even like diabetes, high blood pressure and all of these things kick in. And anemia, nutritional uh, okay. impact in the form of bone problems, osteoporosis, osteopenia, anemia. So all of these things, um, you know, tingling sensation in the extremities, um, imbalance, epilepsy, uh, you name it. And of course, okay. mental health issues, depression, schizophrenia, attention deficit disorders, ADD, ADHD. Um, right, right. Even, even in the know, kids, so uh, even... we have seen, yeah, so, the, so many symptoms are emerging uh, even at the very, very early ages. And yes. uh, yeah, so so how early were your experience with, with the kids? So even autism uh, is being treated with a gluten-free diet today. Oh, okay. No. Okay, so how early so, basically parents should actually address it if it's something they are seeing and they're not able to actually make out like what the problem is actually. So uh, yes, how early so they should act on it? I think uh, they, the red flags begin, it, they can begin very early. Today, we are seeing congenital autoimmune problems like um, kids who are with, at birth having diabetes or thyroid disorders or arthritis, etc. So if those are the conditions or your child is anemic or your child is showing a behavior problem or your child gets tired or your child is unable to gain weight or is not gaining height or is not unable to lose weight or is gaining too much weight. So any of these things which seem illogical, which the which seem like uh, are chronic and are not going away, if the child is suffering from sinus issues, or uh, okay. you know repeatedly falling ill, um, if you see, see skin issues, even leukoderma, vitiligo, we see okay. young kids today with vitiligo and uh, the patches just disappear when you take out uh, the wheat and some grains. Yeah, okay. when you treat the gut, we are able to. Uh, right you know, treat those people which were not getting treated with medication. Medication, yeah. right, right. So uh, it's as early, I mean, so anything which is chronic and then um, you must rule out celiac disease. 
and you must rule out uh, food sensitivity. There are IgG tests uh, today which are available, which help you uh, document the problem. But the you know sometimes we don't have good tests, so okay. we can just do an elimination and see. You know, a lot of people say, "How do we know?" Mm -hmm. So take yes. it out of your diet for about a month or two months and see how you're feeling. And if you feel a difference, then certainly that's the way to go. And then you okay. seek professional help. You just yeah. don't put it out and see because there are there are many parts of the diet which need to right. be addressed. Absolutely, absolutely. So like one month is a good period of time where with where the kid yes. people can try it out. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And yes. Uh, yeah. So and uh, like a lot of people nowadays consider gluten free diet also as a fad and try to follow it even without knowing the actual purpose why we are following it. Uh, we know that's a necessity for people actually who are going, uh, who are actually going through the intolerances of the wheat and wheat related disorders. But uh, can it also be a healthy choice for people, for, for all, all of us, basically, who are trying to uh, lead a happy, healthy uh, lifestyle? That's a very, very good question, Kanika, because uh, yes, it, it all depends on how you define the diet. If it's okay. just, uh, for instance, if, why do we go to gluten-free? Let's look at a vegetarian diet. So a vegetarian diet can be very unhealthy and it can be very healthy. Yes, yes. So I can be a very unhealthy vegetarian if I'm just going to be eating parathas and puris <laughs> and alu and paneer and cholas and dal and call myself a vegetarian. vegetarian. So it doesn't work. So simply eliminating something from the diet is not going to translate into good health unless you mm. make sensible, healthy choices. Exactly. So what you're going to substitute, if I'm going to put mounds of white rice on my plate and not mm. have uh, gluten, that's mm. also counterproductive. If I'm going to have loads of uh, you know, gluten-free, sugar-laden sweets, it's not going to help. If right. I'm going to have sugary drinks and fried food and junk food, which is gluten-free, uh, it's not going to help. So it's really what you uh, put out there and how do you define the diet. So um, it is certainly uh, you know very easy for any trend or any um, concept to become a fad that we can't help because you know that's the nature of uh, right. food and food trends right. you know if somebody does something and the neighbor also does it and then some the neighbor also without understanding it uh, yeah. you know it just has that kind of ripple effect and it becomes a fad but uh, if you look at the science the science is 100% clear it's accurate the science is being taught in universities uh, you know the premium institutions in uh, overseas teaching institutions harvard etc the science of the gut and gluten and all of these things are being taught and uh, so it's certainly uh, out there very very um, evidence based and um, rooted also in our traditional uh, science a traditional wisdom of food so that also it it completely resonates like you know, they said Jaisa An Vaisa Man. Right. That was what was said traditionally in Ayurveda. And they all said everything begins in the gut. Hippocrates said the same thing. Right. So it's right. like coming a full circle. So there are no doubts about it. If it goes into a fatty uh, um, segment, it's uh, it's by the, you know, the way things are being put out. And therefore, what you are doing is very important to set out the right, right. message that it should not just become everybody should, you know, start. Yeah putting it out it's not like that but uh, certainly if you have problems you need to seek professional help and do it right and mm -hmm. what you choose in terms of a gluten-free diet is very important you must have the good fats there you must have your uh, proteins uh, in good quantity you must have plenty of brightly colored vegetables and fruits out there you must make healthy alternative choices like millets are a wonderful choice right. and which grain in millets some people are not able to tolerate millets and you know it could be rice so whatever you choose it has to be uh, you know it should be unpolished rice ideally a little bit of combination is okay but you have to see the totality and the context of the entire right. uh, yeah. diet so uh, yes we should prevent it from becoming a fad it should be followed under supervision and uh, bought out food particularly uh, the bakery and you know the alternatives in biscuits and cakes are full of additives and full of things which are not really good for us so um, it, it's just not a gluten-free diet it should be a healthy diet with minimal uh, processing and junk food
Yeah, right, absolutely. So we have seen like so many people uh, nowadays who are on a gluten free diet. The only thing like eating dal and rice is the very safest option. And they have very, mm. very little knowledge on the millets, which is mm. basically as even it has come from the government of India and everybody's talking, United Nations is talking about India participating. So with this international year of millets, people are actually now uh, opening their minds and actually thinking about it. Okay, now, okay. So, okay, India is the largest producer of millets. So why not? We are, why we are not using millets in our daily life? So, uh, so how millets can be helpful for people with celiac disease and uh, can help with the wheat allergies or intolerances? Wow. Uh, and what makes basically millets as a superfood uh, of today, especially from ancient grain from India? Yeah. Yes, I think the word is diversity today. And uh, millets really offer a great uh, solution to improve the diversity uh, not only in um, in you know in terms of choice of grains, but also the diversity of gut flora that we have. I'll speak about the gut flora uh, right now, and the diversity in the environment. You know, we we need the ecological diversity as well. So it comes a full circle. So the outside world, the outside ecosystem, and our inside ecosystem, we all need diversity. And millets, um, in you know the way they are in India, the number of varieties we have about eight millets, and eight, all of them have sub varieties in different parts of, of uh, different states, and they have different colors and different properties, nutritional profiles, and of course we all have the benefit of so many varieties and thousands of varieties of rice as well. We have black rice, red rice, yeah. white rice, and um, brown. You know all brown these uh, very rice, uh, rice, rice varieties, hers. short yeah, grain, long, long grain. So uh, when we put them all together, I think we are in a far better nourished uh, state than having just mono grains, which, which when you put millets there, it, it immediately changes. So uh, we, we are just used to having chapatis, one grain, and at best yes. some rice. But uh, when you put the millets there and you take out the wheat chapati, you have seven or eight varieties of grains to choose from. So you can do Monday ragi and Tuesday uh, jowar mm. and Thursday uh, Wednesday bajra and uh, uh, the you know foxtail millet and then you know right. the uh, the little millet. This so every day and then you can have few varieties of rice. If you can just do that, it really helps the gut microbiome. So when I said microbiome, it really, when we speak about the gut, what is in it in the gut, which really impacts us, two parts of the gut. The gut is really about digestion and that's a conventional um, understanding of the system, the digestive system that the, the gut is supposed to digest the food and, you know, help us absorb the nutrients. So that is certainly one part of the gut. But all of this in the gut is being controlled by uh, what we have, the microorganisms, the microflora, the, the bacteria, the fungus, the viruses, etc. All of these are in huge numbers and uh, almost now considered an organ in itself. And they, they control everything, whether it's digestion or whether it's assimilation or whether it's inflammation, um, everything about your immune system and about the way you think, your mood, etc. The neurotransmitters, the appetite controlling hormones, everything is being master controlled and even your genes. Okay. are being controlled by the microbiome. microbiome. So, uh, so a happy microbiome is in good balance of good bacteria and uh, lower levels of unfriendly bacteria or micro microorganisms. And um, if you feed these, so you really have to understand that you are not feeding yourself, you're feeding your bacteria. If you're kind to them, They'll, they'll work for you if you're unkind to them, if you put poisons and you put chemicals and you put medicines um, and you all in the name of cheat days and all those, uh, you know, uh, uh, right. unnecessary uh, qualifications of bad food, um, that is going to hurt the bacteria badly. And uh, so particularly people who are on, uh, say, uh, say, a gluten-free diet, can we have a cheat day? I mean, really, can you have one day of poison? It just doesn't work. Yeah. And, you know, all the good work that you've done in building your, rebuilding your gut flora goes down the drain. Right. So it's not about, in, indulgence is fine. You can have indulgence days where you eat the food, but don't cheat on the grains. That's not possible mm -hmm. when you are sensitive. Okay. Uh, so, um, you know, that is something which I really, uh, you know, think it uh, needs to go out there because I'm hearing too many people 
you know, bring right, that up right. and especially like if they're con- talking about millets, but one day can we have a wheat? I mean, it all depends on who you are also. Right, I mean, are you right. really If you are intolerant, yeah. So yeah, you uh, can't no, digest not, that, not yeah. that, not that. If you're intolerant or celiac, the, the, the guidelines are the same. There right. is zero tolerance. But if you're not any of that and you just want to eat healthy, sure, certainly you can have your wheat paratha right. also. There's no problem. But if you are following the diet in letter and spirit, then it has to be in letter and spirit. Then it cannot be a cheat day. So, right. um, you know, you disturb the gut flora. You you make it, you're unkind to it. And uh, then by the time it gets reset, you've already damaged it again. Right. So we, we really have to eat um, in accordance to... Uh, what is right for our gut microbiome right right so but a lot of people uh, face this problem in their daily cooking like uh, uh, even like cooking with the millets uh, means how how well people accept millets and the other grains which are gluten-free in their daily diets to make different kind of recipes which are easy for them convenient for them and they yeah. can follow it on a on a on a daily routine wise not it's because it's a matter that you have to follow for your lifeline lifetime right so you need to have uh, uh, the things which you really like uh, to be added in your food on a daily basis and do you see that uh, millets can be part of that daily regime for everybody and how so easy the cooking would be possible for everybody to have uh, yes a yes on a daily basis right? because i've seen like people they are not comfortable uh, there are a lot of shortcomings of millets like people say ki, there's a bitterness in the grains there are um, uh, you can't uh, uh, have a proper binding of a chapati you can't uh, keep the millet for a longer shelf life. So a lot of problems are there. And uh, uh, we are also working with uh, a lot of uh, food technologists wherein we see that the sprouting of the millets actually can ho- help uh, in a lot of these problems, taking away these lot of problems because sprouting removes the bitterness of the grains, even for the millet grains. And uh, when the taste is good, then obviously it can be used at a varied recipe levels, uh, can be consumed by kids easily. You can make chapati. So like uh, uh, like like we from we at Nikan we do green banana flour, and when we saw when we add green banana flour to the millet flour, it it actually gives that binding which is necessary for for any gluten free uh, atta or a dough to be made. So do you see such uh, uh, complaints from your uh, uh, <laughs> basically uh, uh, patients basically coming to you and asking that Ishi how we can actually eat millets on a daily basis? Uh, yes, there is a certainly truth in what you're saying. We do experience that. Uh, but just to go back to the previous question, uh, let me just complete the thing about the variety of grains and the diversity. So the more diverse your gut flora, but it can, it, that becomes a more strong immune system and a strong digestive system. Uh, okay. uh, the the um, the diversity in the gut flora can increase by the diversity of the grains, right. you know, simply and the diversity of the vegetables and fruits. So basically, a varied diet helps to build a diverse gut flora, which makes you stronger, both in terms of digestion, assimilation, and all the other functions. So that is achieved by uh, using variety of grains and how to put that variety of grains into your body is something which uh, needs to be uh, learned because it is not really something which we uh, have grown up with. But tradition has it that there are so many ways in which you can use the grain as a whole. You can soak it, you can ferment it, you can uh, germinate it. You know, all these processes help to make it uh, more uh, easy to prepare and to digest. And... uh, uh, the flowers that when you make the flowers, you can make them uh, far better for you if you use those processes. Um, and um, also the flowers, like for instance, if you can't make a roti, a simple tip is a cup of uh, flour with a three quarter cup of boiling water. So boil the water and just put that flour and cook it and make a dough out of that. Let it sit for okay. some time and make the chapatis. Yeah. They come out brilliantly. So, uh, you know, those little, little things in the kitchen, which can be, word can go around uh, very, very, uh, you know, bit, you know, it can be word of mouth and through all the channels that uh, we we are talking about today. And uh, that's, that's all it takes. And uh, you can then also see what works for you and your palate and your product, you know, uh, what 
uh, what is more acceptable to you? What what uh, on the palate? What you digest better? Are you bloated? Are you so those things can evolve, but uh, certainly uh, getting uh, the change in is the first step, and uh, getting them onto your table and your uh, you know on, on your food in and it's happening. I mean, I know thanks to uh, yeah. the honorable prime minister who's spoken uh, at length about. Uh, promoting these grains has taken it to a different level. Uh, this message is going across to the industry, to the food manufacturers, and lots and lots of alternative products are being uh, made. But we don't have to add value to those uh, to the products and then have those value-added products only. We can put them out in our kitchens ourselves also right, to replace right. the staples, make the dosas, make the breads make the cookies uh, with with these and experiment and learn and lots of recipes are also coming out there. I just saw a recipe book by the ministry okay. and uh, with tons and tons of healthy recipes. So yeah, it's a time for change and I think that is the key, really the game changer and that is what is really going to address the nutritional um, problems and the malnutrition um, statistics can change very very quickly once this gets uh, going and it already has and i'm very optimistic about um, the change uh, because it's happening at all levels and i think conversations like these and people like you who are doing right. these things uh, can really play a very very significant uh, role so yeah 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 we are but you have really, to start yeah. you have to start somewhere to start yeah. somewhere yeah bring the change yeah absolutely yeah, and, and it's according to me a revival because this was all a part of our culture earlier we right. were having you just have to bring them culture. back yeah yes. yes and as a you know agricultural grains cultivated grains came only much later millets were the earliest uh, 5,000 years ago, even some researchers say 10,000 years, there's evidence of use of millets. And millets were just grown. They were not grown. I mean, they were growing. They Nobody planted them. So, right. uh, you know, so they have been in existence. We just have to rediscover the forgotten grains. Right, right. Absolutely. Uh... Uh, so I would like to uh, I'll ask you the last question basically for our uh, session. Uh, so can you share uh, uh, with our listeners the initiative which is taken by the Salix Society and you personally that has created impact uh, or awareness among individuals and how people can join uh, the mission together? Yes, uh, thanks for uh, bringing that up, uh, Kanika. Yes, uh, we, we were the first people um, as a group of uh, you know, professionals in nutrition and medical uh, field to address this way back in 2006. And uh, primarily, it came out of the fact that, you know, personal stories and journeys where we realized that so many people would be suffering from anemia and uh, health problems without knowing uh, the real reasons for it and uh, how treatable it is only through food and uh, no medicine is required and uh, you know the dietary treatment itself is uh, all that is needed and how that in a country like ours where malnutrition anemia and diarrhea are the three biggest uh, causes for uh, death okay. and uh, disability in um, that if we are not being able to address through all these you know over 50 years of uh, intervention and education and awareness that has happened and uh, so it was high time we kind of uh, brought this out uh, among professionals uh, medical experts not only uh, uh, in you know the field of gastroenterology but uh, you know across all specialties included so we have a representation from many, many diverse uh, fields, um, uh, part of our CDX society. And um, from then on to now, I think uh, we've made a um, huge difference, uh, I would say, without being a, you know, um, with all my humility and whatever. But I think when we started in 2006, the word celiac was really unheard of by most people. Absolutely. The gluten uh, concept was just not there. And today when you go out, it's like most people, most people. Uh, at you know different levels uh, of even food industry, they understand gluten. 
So uh, I think uh, we've been at it and uh, we are still at it. Uh, the right information needs to go out to the right people and the population, general population, and create awareness among people who to diagnose it. That means the medical people, right. fraternity. Right. So even there, there is a lot of uh, you know a lot of gaps. And uh, since it's not being taught even in medical textbooks beyond one paragraph, you know, a small uh, description of celiac disease as a childhood diarrheal disease. Mm -hmm. is all that is you know even in our textbooks it was one of the causes for anemia that was it and it was just a small so today we know that you know the average age of diagnosis of celiac disease is 45 years that it can happen to anyone at any mm -hmm. age it's a genetic disorder it's autoimmune and it need not be diarrheal and diarrheal cases are only 25 30 percent and most mostly they are uh, you know they have other yeah. symptoms and uh, so on and so forth. So basically that uh, awareness of uh, about celiac disease and wheat related disorders, which went beyond celiac, which was like I said earlier in the show that uh, non-celiac wheat sensitivity has become a bigger entity than celiac disease. Celiac disease is about 1% of the population globally, but this one, we don't have data, but it, it's yeah. almost one third percent people one third people population may be suffering if not more yeah so um you know that whole narrative needs to uh, be there and uh, beyond the gut it's uh celiac disease and wheat related disorders beyond the gut that you know how can my uh, my alopecia be connected to my gut and the wheat related disorder how can my joint pain be related to that how can my acne be a part of uh, you know gluten uh, story yeah. so that beyond the gut is where uh, we really focused on and uh, we um, my first book was in 2009 which was uh, again the first book on celiac disease in our country is wheat killing you published by penguin and uh, thereafter you know i wrote two three other books and now the 4g connection which is uh, you know gut gut yeah. gluten and glucose and it really is something which um, seems like almost like a you know consequence of what is evolving in our practice and our learning. And uh, yes. I think this is a journey which is just going on. And uh, the society has organized smaller events and you know uh, annual events for the population, for the people who are suffering and the you know community, and also for medical professionals. And the largest conference we've had on this for the first time in India was International Symposium on Wheat-Related Disorders. Okay. This was uh, way back in 2019, not too far ago uh, along, but uh, it was the first of its kind where we had a representation from many, many countries, uh, right from uh, New Zealand, and Australia to Europe and um, you know the US. So it was uh, experts who came together physically and uh, okay. we deliberated on these issues uh, with our medical professionals and students. And uh, we're planning to have the second ISWD uh, International Symposium on Wheat Related Disorders with the backdrop of millets um, wow. And maybe it happens in Bombay. That's our, uh, wow. our okay. destination this time. We would love to time. participate uh, in the same. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's what we are planning. And uh, yeah, we're doing whatever we can. So publications, we have a newsletter and uh, we you know, circulate it among a very captive audience. And um, you know, we, we are doing whatever we can, but a lot more needs to be done for sure. Yeah, absolutely, Ishi. Um, Thank you so much uh, for the session. Um, as we at uh, NECAN is also on a mission to spread awareness about food intolerances. And I would request all the viewers uh, to get their own copy of Ishi's book. Uh, again, uh, I'm naming it uh, 4G to Good Health. Uh, and it's available on Amazon. Uh, people, please be aware, understand your body science. Choose the healthy options to suit your own body. Uh, so thank you, uh, Ishi, again. Uh, to uh, to basically embrace all of us with your knowledge thank you so much for thank having you so much thank you for having me all the best and i hope everyone enjoys the book yes